every once in a while, a movie like this comes around that makes it really hard to be the guy that champions remakes. What is up everybody and welcome to my review of the remake of Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. So if you did not have the joy of growing up with this 90s classic, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead is a film that came out that was led by Christina Applegate where she is left with her siblings alone for the summer with this bitch babysitter who dies on the very first night of her duty and then they now have to fend for themselves the rest of the summer while their mom is on vacation. And through those trials and tribulations, mostly Christina Applegate's character but her siblings as well, grow up and become better people by summer's end. There's certainly a lot of dated elements to it. This is right on the cusp of the 80s style transitioning over to the 90s, so it's very distinct for being an early 90s film. But the heart of what this movie achieves, I think, is pretty timeless. And all three of my kids have really enjoyed this film. My seven-year-old, I just introduced to this about a month ago. Pretty poor timing on my part since they're getting ready to bastardize it with this remake, but she's watched it about seven or eight times since then, so the appeal of the film, that timeless coming of age element, I think still works very well. Then a few weeks ago, I came across the teaser of this upcoming film on Twitter, and to be honest with you, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a parody. Everything about the way that trailer was cut, the quality of it, it just looked like somebody getting ready to do like an SNL bit, and I was very upset to find out, no, this is, this is really a thing that's happening. But despite how awful the marketing has been, despite how cynical it is very easy to be in regards to the approach of this film, I started to get slightly curious because they did say that it's going to be rated R and I'm sure they can't show a lot of the rated R stuff in the trailer. So maybe they're just making all of the marketing centered around some of the iconic lines and some of the recognizable scenarios from the original film and there's actually going to be quite a bit that's unique and different and fresh about this film that we're going to have to spend money and go find out in the theater. Well, unfortunately, this is not the case. This is one of those remakes that is absolutely a quintessential example of why so many people roll their eyes and immediately become cynical for race swap or gender swap remakes because it just gives the impression that swapping the race or the gender of some of the main characters is the only bit of creativity that the filmmakers put into this. You don't like to think that way and sometimes they can prove you wrong. This is one of those times they prove you right. But really quick before we unpack this nightmare, while watching bad remakes can certainly take a toll on your health, you could swing the pendulum in the other direction and make good health decisions by checking out the sponsor of today's video, AG1. Over the last couple of years, I've made a lot of lifestyle changes, primarily with diet, trying to have a healthier lifestyle and to feel better in that everyday life. And having a job that keeps me locked at home in front of a computer or in a theater surrounded by a bunch of sugary and buttery snacks, definitely makes that difficult. And unfortunately, I'm also the type of person that does not like to take a bunch of different supplements trying to make up for the flaws of my diet. Well, luckily, I started drinking AG1. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health, including gut, brain, and immune system. I like that I can get all of my vitamins, minerals, superfoods, antioxidants, probiotics, and even more all in one drink. Because one drink is easy to incorporate into my morning routine. Just add one scoop to 8 to 10 ounces of water, shake it up, and enjoy. Did you know that even if you do have a good diet, some vitamins and minerals are just naturally hard for your body to process? AG1 makes it easier by sourcing ingredients specifically intended for absorption, potency, and nutrient density. To name a few of the benefits that I have enjoyed from AG1 the most, one of them is immune defense. If you have kids, you know how often they come home with some new virus or illness from school. Increased focus and energy, which definitely benefits me in late night editing sessions, and you don't have that dreaded crash that comes with coffee or energy drinks. And finally, there's the stress recovery, which being a YouTuber, a father of three, and a husband, I have no shortage of stressors in my life. If you're interested in making AG1 a part of your morning ritual, click my link in the video description below or scan the QR code in the bottom left to get a free one year supply of AG Vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free travel packs with your first purchase. 
So take an easy step towards a happier and healthier you by checking out AG1, and thank you to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. Starting off with the positives, there are certain elements to this movie that are certainly modern, with technology, with the habits of kids and teenagers that I could see some people, some teenagers, some young kids, maybe even some adults watching this film that has never seen or maybe even never heard of the original and enjoying it and getting a decent amount out of it and maybe this will become the film that they will tell their kids about 20 years from now. Maybe. That's always a possibility with remakes. Lord knows there's plenty of remakes that I love that people are like, how do you not love the original? Because I didn't see the original, I saw the remake first and that's, that's the one that I have the attachment to. It's possible. I also think that they did a really good job at the main relationship here. So in the original film, it was between Sue Ellen and uh, Brian, the little clown dog delivery driver. And there's a point in the film where he gets very pissy about the level of secrecy that she has regarding her job, which she has because she works with his sister and doesn't want him to know that she's basically lying about her age and, you know, potentially committing fraud. Same scenario here, but what I think they actually do a little bit better in this remake is that they give the love interest more of a believable reason to have an attitude. They give him more of a reason to take issue with uh, the character's name is Tanya in this movie, with Tanya's secrecy, more of a reason for him to question question their relationship. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details why, not that it's a spoiler, but it doesn't matter. But the reasons that lead him to eventually say, hey, what the fuck's going on? Like, what are you doing all day? What, what's the deal? What's all the secrecy? It's more believable than it was in the original, where the original just kind of made him look like a, a, a whiny bitch. And the final positive is that Simone Joy Jones, who plays Tanya, the Sue Ellen of this movie, I think she did decent. You know, I don't blame her for this movie. She didn't write the script. She didn't put it into production. Uh, as an actress, I think she did just fine being the lead of this story. She's not as memorable or as charismatic as Christina Applegate was, but she does fine. Moving on to the mixed aspects, there's something that they tried to do in this movie that when it first started to happen, I actually got angry. I was like, what? That, no, that is absolute sacrilege of the original film. But then by the end of it, there was some things about it that actually worked out. So essentially they take the character of Carolyn, who, if you've seen the original film, you know is a very solid argument for the biggest cunt in movie history. I need to fax something. How would I do that? Gosh, Sue Ellen, being an executive administrative assistant, I'm sure you can figure that out. They take her character and her rivalry and her bitchiness and they combine that with the character of Kathy, who in the original film was this very sweet, very helpful, lower on the totem pole worker that uh, essentially Sue Ellen gets to do all of the hard work that she has no idea what the fuck she's doing. And if I have one flaw with the original film that I love, it's that by the end of the film, there's never one single scene that Sue Ellen gives Kathy the credit. And I think Kathy should have gotten her position when Rose leaves the party. That's the one scene that's missing from that original film. But yeah, they take the absolute bitch character that you are supposed to absolutely hate from the moment that she comes on screen and they make it a scenario where she starts to feel like, okay, maybe we should work together, Tanya. Maybe we should get past some of this. Let me help you with some of your work and you know, we'll get past all of our bullshit. But then Tanya fails to give her credit for doing the QED report. And so then you get full Carolyn again for the second half of the film. When they first started to do that, I was like, how in the hell are you gonna combine those two characters? You're either gonna destroy what Carolyn is for this story, or you're gonna really miss out on being able to do Kathy better than the original film. And what I actually ended up liking about them doing that is that I get more of an understanding and a little bit more of an investment in why Carolyn dislikes Tanya so much and why she has such a vendetta against her that goes all the way through to the end of the film but they still fail to completely bring it home. They still don't give you the ultimate satisfaction of either Tanya completely learning her lesson and hey, you got a lot of help from somebody, you should give them full credit and make sure that they get the job that they deserve, or getting a scene that really kind of redeems Carolyn fully. They, they, they touch on it, they, they dip their toe in it, which ultimately I think even made me more frustrated that they kind of gave me a hint of, oh, I'm not the only one that feels like that's a missing scene from the original, and this is their way to rectify that. Oh, they didn't do it either. Well, fuck. 
Now moving on to the negatives. Like I said in the beginning, most people tend to be very cynical when they do race swap remakes or gender swap remakes because we have had so many that are basically carbon copies of the original and that's the only thing that's different or they feel like swapping the genesis of the humor like in the Ghostbusters remake that that's somehow going to be funny and it's actually just kind of cringeworthy. There's so many examples of it going wrong that it's hard for people to be optimistic. And unfortunately, this is yet another movie that does it the absolute wrong way. You have the exact same scenario. You have similar personality types in these characters as the white versions in the original. And the only element of it that is different here is some of the worst race-focused humor that I have seen in a very long time. Oh, and you might hear music, but it's Christian hip hop. Hip hop ruined the blacks. Maybe I'm not the target audience for it. Maybe a black audience would love these jokes and that is absolutely a possibility and you'll find out in the comment section if that is the case. But I I've seen and I've heard a lot of really effective race humor, whether it's offensive or not. And this movie just goes for the easiest and unfunny jokes that it can find. Like you have Mrs. Sturak that dies. That is the inciting incident of this film. And in the first film, they try to get rid of her body. They try to dump it off at this cemetery because they're kids and they don't know any better. They don't know what the hell they're supposed to do. Here, they dump her body in a fucking lake because they say, oh, well, if we call an ambulance for this bitch, the white cops are obviously going to shoot us on sight because they're not going to believe we live in a house. What? Yeah, okay. Police brutality against blacks. That's not like a new subject, but that's not the basis for a joke in the way that you just told it. Like, it's, there's nothing funny about that. There's no punchline to that. You're just saying it for the sake of having it in there. And all throughout the movie, there's like moments like that. Like why Kenny won't get a job. They make a joke about how, cause he's a black guy there. He's not gonna be able to get hired anywhere. And it's just like, it, it's trying to like have commentary while excusing it as a joke, but it's not good, effective commentary and the joke isn't funny. So it's like the worst version of trying to have your cake and eat it too. Only nobody likes the taste of this cake. I can imagine there's some genuinely interesting things you could do to change up the dynamics of these characters or change up the dynamics of these classic scenarios from the original with a black cast. But the way that they do it here is just, it's the most cringeworthy version of that. And beyond all of that, this does what is one of the most infuriatingly egregious things that a remake can do. That is oftentimes the, the basis for most people's distaste for remakes in general, is that it just carbon copies all of the more famous and iconic and memorable sequences of the first film. Line for line, situation for situation, only every single one of them are microwaved and just quickly thrown together. They don't have the impact, they don't have the soul, they don't have the edge or the attitude that the original film had. So when you've got Kenny smashing the dishes with a baseball bat and just going, this is done, man. It's like a bad cover band. You know, it's like somebody doing creative plagiarism. Like if you wanna take a couple of iconic lines, sure, most remakes do that. And oftentimes they don't do it in a way that's as memorable or as impactful as the original, but just to go beat for fucking beat to essentially take the same script at least 80 percent the same except for some of these weak attempts to modernize it and just regurgitate that out again that fucking movie already exists that's what i can't stand about when some people bring out remakes and they're just like yeah well let's just do the same shit only our cameras look better and you know these people are younger and we got a modern edge. Even the way that they present Mrs. Sturak, which is just the inciting incident of the movie, but it's the title of the film, The Babysitter Who Dies, that sets off the events of the story. In the original, she's just this overbearing drill sergeant old bitch that they need to get past and situation works itself out in a way they didn't expect. Here, She's just an old racist white lady. The first fucking thing she does is fire a starter pistol in the air and say, I know how to handle all you little black kids. I watched Medea. And by the way, she doesn't say black kids. She says little N-words and not the word, like literally little N-words is the line. Which brings me to my next point. So 
The other thing that they kind of advertise this thing off of is that this is a modern rated R retelling of this story, which is admittedly the only thing that gave me some curiosity and some pause on my cynicism and going, hmm, well, maybe they just can't show us all the new stuff because it's too adult. I don't really know how adult you could make this story because it's a story that appeals to younger people more than it does adults, but we'll see. I have no fucking idea why this was rated R. Like, I don't understand it whatsoever. It's basically the same exact movie. The only thing I could think of is there's one throwaway vague reference to squirting that's made by Nicole Richie's Rose in this film. That's the only thing that I caught that could even be considered rubbing shoulders with an adult joke. And I assumed it was probably just gonna be by language. It was probably gonna be exactly the same script, although they're gonna say fuck a few more times. And every single time they're about to go that route, every single time somebody's about to drop an F-bomb, they do that classic cliche, we need to have a PG-13 rating thing where they go, you little mother <sighs> They do it like three times in this movie. And yet it's still rated R. Why? <laughs> Not only do you fail at modernizing what I consider to be a 90s classic, but you completely shut out and alienate the audience that you should be appealing to by making it rated R for fucking reasons? I mean, beyond that, what else is there to say? I mean, the, the entire coming of age appeal of this story is just haphazardly done here. I mean, there's nothing that makes you really invest or get some enjoyment out of these kids' journey. I mean, Tanya is the only character that seems to have somewhat of a maturity by the end of this one. Kenny, who is one of the more popular characters from the original film, who, just like in the original here, is a, is a lazy stoner degenerate, but they forget to make him likable and they forget to give him an arc to make him also reach some form of maturity. He just randomly starts cooking shit in the third act. They never really show him like, get into Julia Child or start to realize the error of his ways or how much that Tanya, the Sue Ellen of this story is sacrificing while he's just being a fucking lazy piece of shit. Like there's no moment where the movie pauses to actually develop that. He just randomly starts fucking making enchiladas and shit. And you're like, oh, I guess he's mature now. Fuck you! And Nicole Richie's rose. Oh. If we're not alone, and I ask you for something, you just say. I have no disdain for Nicole Richie as a person. I've never seen her act before. In fact, I used to have a crush on her back when she was hanging out with Paris Hilton all the time, but uh, that's one of, if not the most iconic character from the original film. I'm right on top of that, Rose. Like, there, there's so many things about Rose that is so 1991 that she's one of the more standout characters of this story, one of the more iconic characters. And apparently she loved the character and wanted to take her own spin on it. And, and cool, like, I, I'm glad she got the chance to, to fulfill her dream in some way, but she has nothing to bring the appeal that the Rose character needs. I mean, her acting is wooden the entire time. The way that she executes some of these iconic lines and just the iconic nature of Rose, this high level executive, it just completely falls flat. There's an attempted joke by the end of it that like a high schooler is gonna fuck her and it's like, why? why? Again, if you're gonna go rated R, just fucking go there. Go for the adult crass joke. Don't hint at it. And the joke that you're hinting at is Really not that funny anyway. Uh, yeah, one of the more disappointing aspects, which I could tell from the very first trailer whenever they, they ended on her setting up that iconic line that it's just, it's just gonna be dead on arrival. And the final negative, and then we can just wrap this bitch up and never talk about this movie again for the rest of history, is the cameos and the Easter eggs. Now, to be fair, there was one cameo that the placement in the movie, where my attitude was at the time, it certainly perked me up for a moment. It did make me smile. I don't think they did enough with the cameo, otherwise I would maybe throw this into the mixed category, but there's a moment where a cameo did bring a smile to my face at the end of the film. Uh, there's another cameo that's about halfway through that's absolute throwaway, which is a shame because I just find it, I find it disrespectful to that actress and I'm actually shocked that they even took the job because it's just like, you're coming back for this moment? There, there's nothing stand out about you saying this line. They could have given this line to anybody. Ugh. Anyway, there's more Easter eggs too. I mean, there, I think there's a spot where the kids are actually watching the original Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, which 
I guess should be cute, but then begs the question of how the fuck they don't look at this movie and say, damn, that's a similar situation that we're in. And finally, there is a music uh, needle drop by the end of the film that, again, it was immediately following the cameo that perked me up a bit, and this music drop started to perk me up, but then they cut it off for a joke. And I thought to myself immediately, man, if they just had this piece of music throughout this film, that could have brought enough nostalgia to get it at least one star higher. That, that's just the power of nostalgia there, but they don't utilize it that way. They just utilize it for a cheap joke. To wrap all this up, I'm gonna leave you with an anecdote. So I actually took my seven-year-old daughter to go see this movie. This was her, her gift for getting good days all week in school. She adores the original, it's her current movie obsession, and when she found out there was a new one coming out, she asked me multiple times if I would take her to go see it. And even though it was rated R, I was pretty confident that it was just gonna be because of language. So my parental instincts luckily were proven correct. The movie didn't do anything different from the original script and the rated R was for reasons I honestly don't understand to this day. So we walk out of this movie. I already have my thoughts, of course, but I ask her, I'm like, so did you like it? She literally turns to me and she says, yeah, I liked it. I mean, it's the same movie, only the other people look like us. Even a seven-year-old knows this is bullshit. Overall, guys, are there many people on planet Earth that are going to be as hot and bothered about disrespecting Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead as me? Probably not, but I don't care. This is a movie that is a classic of my childhood. It is already a classic of my children's childhood, and it, to me, this remake just represents everything that is wrong with remakes. Everything that makes people so cynical and so negative at just the announcement of a remake. You know, have I seen worse films? Absolutely, I'm gonna see plenty. This might not even crack my bottom 10 of the year, but it just insults me as a fan whenever somebody takes something that's beloved and they try to profit off of that name and just put zero fucking effort and creativity into actually doing something with it. They race swap the characters, they put a lot of cheap race jokes in here that I can't find anybody finding funny. And everything that is iconic and memorable and nostalgic about the original film, they just fast forward through it and microwave it. So just every element of this annoyed the living shit out of me as a fan of the original. And if you're somebody that enjoys the original quite a bit and really enjoyed what they did with this remake, please, fascinate me with your thoughts down below because I struggle to understand what you saw. That's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all my 2024 new release reviews. I'm also going to put my first episode of Movie Brawl up here for you to check out where we talk about Terminator 1 versus Terminator 2. Please check out AG1 in the video description below and like, share, and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss everything in the future. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.